Hey everyone, welcome to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. In the Mobile User Acquisition Show, we talk about how to use mobile user acquisition strategies to grow your app quickly and capital efficiently. The Mobile User Acquisition Show is presented by me, Shamant Rao, mobile growth leader and founder and CEO of the mobile growth consulting firm, Rocketship HQ. Each episode includes strategies, tips, and pointers from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition that you can use to unlock tremendous growth for your app in a sustainable and capital-efficient manner. Our guest today is Beth Gilmore. Beth is a marketing consultant and founder at The New Department. Beth has an incredible wealth of experience in the programmatic space from her work as the head of commercial partnerships at MOPA. In today's conversation, Beth shares some fascinating insights about how many levers marketers have available to them in order to unpack their programmatic performance. This is so powerful if marketers are savvy enough to dive deep enough to understand what happens under the hood of what can often appear to be a very opaque black box. From knowing what happens even before an ad is shown to being able to influence where in a publisher's inventory an ad is shown, there's so much possibility that this conversation highlights for advertisers, and I'm excited to uncover so much goodness in today's interview. I'm very excited to welcome Beth Gilmore, founder of the new department to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Beth, welcome to the show. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you because uh, we work together and I've certainly seen the sheer depth of insight you have around all things programmatic. You really are able to get into the weeds and really understand the nuts and bolts of how the pro- every bit of how the programmatic ecosystem works. And I'm excited to dive into a lot of that with you today. Yeah, I think uh, marketers really only see a certain level that happens yeah. with programmatic and usually what a DSP shares with them. And so it's, it's always good to lift a veil for marketers to see what's really happening on the back end at an exchange level. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, programmatic is a black box. And seen in a certain light, that's true. But as my conversations with you have shown, that's not entirely true at all. No, I mean, I've, always been a huge fan of programmatic because the framework is all about transacting data and there's so much data to to drive um smart advertising and and if that data is exposed and transparent then it's not a black box but it's really up to the players in the industry who you know share that data or or not um who's who's helping create that black box, like mantra, essentially. Indeed, indeed. So let's assume a marketer is working with a DSP and let's assume, you know, this marketer is savvy enough to really, you know, take the veil off the black box and, you know, and they're like, look, let's work closely with the DSP to actually impact their performance. Uh, and they, this marketer notices, right, our, our performance isn't where it needs to be. So what are some of the areas that you would recommend this marketer investigate so as to troubleshoot uh, their programmatic performance? Yeah, it, it, to give a little bit of context, each DSP will operate um, with an exchange through the OpenRTB spec. And this specification will provide hundreds of various data points um, to the DSP about the device, the app, the user. And if the marketer can have these really interesting in-depth conversations with their DSP about what parameters the DSP is taking into consideration with their exchange integrations and what data points they're not taking into consideration and why aren't they taking those data points into consideration and how do they weight those data points? So I think just really getting into the nitty gritty of 
what data signals are are driving the bidder's algorithms and yeah. how could that potentially be optimized. Um, there's also, there's a DSP's overall bidder health. So coming from the exchange world, we would go through regular health checks with our DSP integrations to make sure that there were, there was low latency, for example, because there could be instances when a, um, uh, DSPs bidding on an impression and that impression would drive an install for that marketer, but they ultimately lose the auction because they didn't bid within the allotted time frame that they needed to. Right. Um, there are times when the bidder will send malformed bid responses and not send data back to the exchange in the protocol that they're supposed to. So they could lose out on, on bids from that. Um, there are also various creative components that might not be known to the marketer. So usually with the video and interstitial and more rich formats, they will, if a bidder's bidding on inventory that has um, maybe low network connectivity or is in a in a geo that's not ideal that's to support the weight of that that ad load there there's a lot of optimization that can even be done at the creative level on the back end that marketers might not know is happening in real time interesting go ahead yeah please not to interrupt go ahead I mean, there are so many it's yeah. it's yeah it's really i think what i would actually suggest to savvy performance marketers is to just go to the OpenRTB spec and learn what data points are, are in the spec and get a sense of what the integration with these exchanges looks like so that they can better have these informed conversations with their DSPs on how to, how to optimize. Yeah, that is very interesting because there clearly are a lot of these data points which may have nothing to do with a marketer's marketing strategy. Totally. But, right? Uh, you know, if a bidder isn't bidding fast enough, that's an engineering problem and mm -hmm. it will absolutely impact marketing performance, even though it has nothing to do with, you know, the performance marketer's strategy. Mm -hmm. That is so fascinating. You know, and you, you did speak about some of the creative components. I'm curious if you could uh, elaborate on that because Again, I think when I speak to a lot of marketers who advertise on programmatic, one of the uh, aspects that does come up is that creatives really don't have that much of an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you speak to how the, some of the creative components influence uh, better performance or mm -hmm. programmatic performance? Yeah, and we've discussed this before that, that an ad will have a life cycle yeah. between the DSP and when they bid and the inventory. So there could be a handful of events that the ad transacts across in this life cycle um, that requires it to successfully end up showing to the user. Yeah. And so it'll involve when the ad is loaded in the system, the marketer uploads the campaign and the creative and then when the DSP bids with that creative into the, the programmatic auction, when they win the auction, then the ad is loaded potentially in the background of the app. Then when the user has time to see it, then the ad is shown. And so through that whole life cycle, there could be many reasons why it doesn't make it to show to right. the user. Right. And, and I think what, what typically will happen in, again, these interstitial and video and more rich media formats is that publishers can cache those ads in the background of their app for periods of time so that right. when the user is ready to see the ad, it'll be a better experience for them. Um, and a lot of ad servers will release the cache after a certain period of time, but sometimes publishers overestimate how long the user is going to be in the app and so there are many times that a dsp will see a very like very high value impression 
bid on it, win it, but then the ad never clears and is never shown to the user. Right. So in those instances, it's really important to see where there's high win rates for certain subsets of inventory. Mm -hmm. And then if there are extremely high win rates with low clear rates, there could be an issue with the creative life cycle or the SDK integration with the publisher or the, a right. whole slew of things that you can then try to troubleshoot. Right, right. So, you know, even if you're winning bids, you may not be actually getting it, the impression, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that could just be something to do with the publisher itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, speaking of the publisher or what can be broadly called the supply side of things, uh, are there things a marketer can potentially do to make sure they are on the right kinds of supply and they're winning enough bets on the right kinds of supply? How should a marketer think about these? I think this is really where having historical performance data is key and every marketer knowing that a certain app or a certain ad unit in a certain geo is driving higher performance for them, that means that they essentially should be spending a, a higher rate for, for that inventory. And I think what, what happens a lot of the time, DSP bidders will over index on spending lower CPMs on high volumes of inventory mm -hmm. and miss out on the higher performing creatives, for example, interstitials or videos in North American locations on new devices because they're going to go to premium. And it's yeah. really up to the marketer to push on the DSPs to to price accordingly and to not always go back to the lower CPMs that m have a lower rate of conversion. Right, right. And, you know, I imagine that's one way where if you leave everything to the algorithm, mm -hmm. you're just going to get the lowest CPM. Yep. Right. And you yep. want to be, as a marketer, influencing the algorithm by essentially biasing it in favor of perhaps the supply sources that have worked well in the past, right? And all the users that have converted well in the past. Exactly. And, and having a, a test program where you really are able to see performance at an exchange level, at a publisher level, at an app level, at a creative level, at an ad unit level. I mean, there are apps that have a, a whole variety of different ad units within the content, you know, like in a game, you might have a full screen uh, rewarded video placement. And then later on in the session, you might be given a banner ad. So like yeah. knowing that that uh, rewarded video placement is going to drive higher performance. Um, and then maybe blacklisting that bad banner ad unit so that you don't have to waste a bit on it, knowing that it's not going to convert. So right. having a, a strong test and get, getting the right data from your DSP to, to put that test program into place. Uh, that's interesting. So when you say test program, this is essentially to identify supply sources app uh, IDs that perform well is, and almost get a seed list is that a fair understanding of what you are proposing, recommending? Absolutely. Got it. And some marketers might have, you know, questions about, oh, if I share my supply sources or particularly if I show, share device IDs, I will have privacy concerns or confidentiality concerns. How do you recommend thinking about this? I think as a marketer, you will only increase your performance dramatically if you share that data with your DSP. Um, right. We'd like to think that every DSP's algorithms are extremely intelligent and yeah. can find those high converting users, but that's, it's, it's not always the case. And there's just, there's so much inventory out there that it's, I think it's almost getting harder for the bidders to stay smart in, in the clutter and commoditized exchange world. And so 
Um, if a marketer has first party data and known users that convert, it's, yeah. it's a really good idea to share that data with your DSP. And then of course you can work it out with them, whether they're allowed to use that data to better yeah. their platform or not. Um, yeah. But yeah, you almost have to share that data to, to drive real performance. Yeah, certainly. And then I think just, sorry, highlighting on the user privacy policy perspective, and that is really having a conversation with your DSP to make sure that they have the proper um, support across their own system and all the various integrations that they have. And and just asking them the hard questions to make sure that they, they're not gonna get you in trouble, basically. <laughs> yeah. Shifting gears a little bit, when a marketer is buying on a DSP, does it matter as to where in the ad monetization waterfall of a publisher the, their ads are shown? And how might a marketer think about this and how it's gonna impact their performance? Yeah, it, it absolutely will impact a campaign's performance based on where, what inventory set they're competing against within the publisher's waterfall stack. I think um, it, so typically publishers will be able to siphon off inventory based on uh, high performing ad units or it's lower session within the user uh, depth and they'll usually siphon the highest value inventory to direct sold ads, direct sold ad advertiser clients. And, and then a DSP will never have access to that high performing inventory because they've, they've already sold it. Um, and sometimes DSPs won't typically will rest in the middle or longer tail subset of the publisher's inventory. And so, being a, a savvy marketer to ask your DSP, do you know your placement within this, the high performing publishers waterfall stacks is absolutely going to drive higher performance. Um, and it kind of just leads into the, the conversation of private marketplaces where uh, PMPs, those are essentially ways for marketers to work directly with publishers to uh, pay a premium or just pay a static price for inventory where they won't have to compete with the entire market or maybe they'll compete with a, a smaller subset of advertisers or DSPs for that inventory, but that's a great way for marketers to basically access inventory in the waterfall that they might not have been able to access. Right, so what you're recommending is really taking a two-pronged approach, which is a, see if you can get first dibs on premium inventory by doing private marketplace deals, right? And for the rest of the inventory, get as much visibility as possible mm -hmm. as to where in the waterfall you are. Got Absolutely. It. And I, there is this trend now in mobile where uh, exchanges are supporting in-app bidding, advanced bidding, which is essentially trying to create one unified auction for all demand to compete at the same priority within the waterfall. But there are just so many publishers that have large teams dedicated to yield management and sales, and um, they'll always continue to have a more advanced, I guess you could say, waterfall where there, there a lot of demand won't be able to compete for, for certain aspects of the inventory. Right. So you're saying there's never going to be a completely open marketplace. There are always going to be side deals like this. Private marketplace deals for the inventory you know performs while also competing in the open market to get a better sense for new inventory or maybe pockets of high performing inventory that that um, then you can set up private marketplace deals for. Right. And when you were describing that, uh, you talk, you spoke of, look, uh, high performing inventory, but also, uh, and correct me if I got this wrong, but you spoke about 
users that were lower in the session. What does that mean? Can you speak to that? Yes. So session depth will essentially indicate where the you where the user is at within one session of the app. So for example, if I open up a music streaming app and within the first 10 seconds of searching for music, I'm prompted with an ad, I will absolutely be more engaged with that ad than after I've been listening to music for an hour. And so it's really important to be able to identify where in the session the user is at so that you can make sure that you're connecting with them throughout the right point in their in their session and attention span essentially. Cool. Got it. That makes sense. Again, for our marketer who's working with the DSP, uh, let's assume the DSP has past IDFAs and Android IDs of past campaigns, perhaps in that genre. Uh, I know you talked about our marketer offering their own uh, device IDs, but what about historical device IDs that the DSP might have? Is that typically something that can be beneficial without running privacy risks for either the DSP or the marketer? Absolutely. I mean, being able to combine historical with current known uh, first party behavioral data will not only increase the performance, but can be done in a way where you're complying with all the various um, policies in place. I mean, according to GDPR, if, if anyone hasn't given consent, then you cannot store and, and log their first party data for advertising purposes. And um, But if that user has, then that historical data is fair game. And right. um, yeah, I, I think there's that's a very smart thing to do. Indeed, indeed. Uh, I think GDPR is a completely different beast. And, you know, yeah. not to get into the weeds of that, but I certainly get what you're saying. Yeah. And, you know, again, for a marketer who's working with the DSP, are there forecasts that might be available for them to help plan better either creative formats or source apps or even exchanges that they could use to make more informed decisions? Yeah. I'll be honest that I haven't really seen that many great forecasting tools out there for programmatic. Um, and really, I, I think it's just hard for publishers themselves to forecast their own inventory. And there's so many different variables at play, uh, like yeah. external factors out of their control or just so I think forecasting has been hard for DSPs and exchanges to do, but there are, coming from the exchange world, there are very robust real-time analytics tools that show what's happening in the marketplace now. And, and DSPs should absolutely share exchange level data, um, app level publisher, creative, geo, you know, all the, all of the basics with their advertisers. And, and likewise, I know that um, if, an app, if a marketer works with an exchange directly, there are a lot of times that that exchange will be able to give the exchange level data to them as well. So yeah. there's, there's definitely a lot of real time data available to make those informed decisions for the future. Indeed, indeed. And as you said, it, while that data may not always be perfect, it's certainly better than flying blind. Yeah. And certainly from everything you've been telling us, Beth, working with programmatic and with exchanges and DSPs is far, far from being a black box. And uh, I think for the smart marketers, I think it behooves them to be much, much more, much better informed so they can make educated decisions. Yep, definitely. That, that's perhaps a good place for us to wrap up this conversation. Much like every time I speak to you, this has been incredibly instructive. So thank you so much for being on the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Thank you for having me. For more tips, 
pointers and strategies from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition. Subscribe to our YouTube channel right here or check out our blog, rocketshiphq.com slash blog. Thank you.